Rock Ranch Day because we got word that they finally talked about the new animated Star Wars series that's in development here. So I'm going to track down our good friend Dave Filoni and ask him all about it. So come on, let's go. He's play acting. He knows quite a bit. It's very nice. He's trying to be your friend, but I'm trying he to knows get a lot more for you guys here. So this is a whole new era to get into in between episodes three and four. Yes, the opportunity to work in the era that I grew up with. You know, even though it precedes that era, uh, this show will precede episode four. It, it's still tremendously exciting because of this visual language is now open to us. And very directly, what Ralph McQuarrie was doing is now open to us in a way that we could never exploit on Clone Wars. You look at Ralph's design, and it's a few degrees off of where it was in Episode Four because it's concept art. That's right. When you use it in Star in Rebels, it's going to be a few degrees off from Episode Four because that's where we are in the timeline. Yeah. We said, what if this was CG? What if these paintings just pop them off and suddenly get the dimension and the same type of camera work that you see in the original films? Um, that would be a very inspired animated series. So let's talk about some of the folks who are joining you on Star Wars Rebels that you had worked with already. Killian Plunkett, who was my uh, design lead on uh, uh, Clone Wars, is on this new show, which is really exciting for me because I, he knows Star Wars inside out. He nitpicks every little detail. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you looking at? Spray nothing, never mind. What are you no, looking at? Fine. What's wrong with it? Nothing, it's fine. Are you counting the spans? No, I was counting the number of window panes. Yes. Oh, well, I made that up. Also, Joel Aaron, another key component of uh, Clone Wars, you know, my wizard, if you will. I want to go as far as uh, really trying to get the the essence and color palette out that you see in all of Ralph and Corey prints. And then that feeling, that journalistic feeling that you get with the lighting, with the color tones in A New Hope. Also working on the show, Greg Weissman, a man that's known very well from animation movies. Paul Garbo, great guy. Well, you know, back in the day for Disney and television, it was one of the first. Woo! I'm really excited that Simon Kinberg is involved in the show. It's pretty exciting. I, I mean, I have to say, we've heard his name attached to Star Wars projects. Now he's consulting on Episode Seven. He's working on his own standalone film. That's right. Big movie guy working on. Big movie. I know. Every time we sit down, I get so excited about just what we're talking about. We haven't even really gotten to it yet in a lot of ways, but you know, just sending him images and then him getting inspired off an image that we sent. And uh, you know, I think the fans are gonna see the payoff when this show airs. Our Rebel Alliance is made up of Greg Weissman and Simon Kinberg. 
this is the strength that Lucasfilm is building to ensure the future of the Star Wars franchise. But one of the things really... No. No. God damn that video guy. Hi, I'm Greg Weissman. I'm one of the executive producers of Star Wars Rebels. I uh, am very excited about the show and kind of bummed that I can't be in New York with you guys at New York Comic Con. Um, but we are very busy working on the show, uh, breaking episodes and writing outlines, writing scripts and recording voices and uh, storyboarding, making animatics and looking at all this material and this great artwork that... Um, Dave Filoni's team has put together, and uh, that kind of precluded a lot of travel right now because um, we're really in the thick of it. So I'm hoping that you know maybe next year, but uh, just have a great time. I know Pablo will treat you all well and give you uh, all sorts of great information. But Pablo, don't spoil too much because I don't like spoilers. <laughs> Bye. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you. I, I'd love to come out, being from the East Coast myself, but. Uh, Really busy here uh, working on the new show, Star Wars Rebels. As you can see all around me, um, little shots and ideas are coming together, uh, working with a great team of uh, Greg Weissman, Simon Kimberg. Uh, you know, got a really talented crew working behind the scenes. So as always, I can't tell you much about the new show, but I thought maybe you'd like to meet or be introduced to some of these people that are making the magic happen. And uh, just keep your eyes open. You might get a glimpse of something uh, rather sinister coming your way. I hope you enjoy. You almost got a glimpse of it there by accident, actually. So, <laughs> but moving on. Uh, you know, Simon is the third executive producer, and he's uh, effectively been kidnapped by by writing commitments with X Men: Days of Future Past, consulting on Episode Seven, and uh, working on his own Star Wars film. So he's not. He's too busy to even record one of these, but he wishes he could have been here as well. So moving on to Rebels, um, before we get into the main topic, I do want to do a, a quick recap of where we've been with the show and what's been talked about already. So um, the first debut really was that video that we, we, we showed earlier, which was in May. And then come in July, uh, Rebels got its first real spotlight at Star Wars Celebration Europe in Essen, Germany. Who here went to that convention? Oh, yeah. That's great. All right, well, this is going to be, I'm not going to redo that presentation. I promise there's new stuff coming out. But I do want to give a recap for those who weren't there. One of the key things that, that there's Dave Filoni talking to Warwick Davis, who was the host of the, of the stage where they presented Rebels. One of the key things that Dave wanted to impress upon the audience was the importance of uh, one man uh, whose, whose work just continues to inspire us to this day. And uh, that's Ralph McQuarrie. And he was... Uh, <laughs> The show draws a lot of inspiration from Ralph's work. He was the concept artist on the original Star Wars trilogy, and he was fundamentally responsible for defining the look and feel of, of those three movies. And uh, it's a, such inspiration that the art department from Rebels actually went to the Lucasfilm archives and looked at the original pieces, the original paintings, the original sketches, so that we not only just see the art, but understand the brush strokes, the paper, the, the line weight, um, really understand that as much as possible because they want to get a, a true sense of how Ralph achieved what he did. And this is one of the, the key pieces of art that, that really kicked off Rebels. It's a concept painting Ralph did in late 1980. And it was during the development of what was then called Revenge of the Jedi. It was early work on episode six. And the idea was at that point in the story that the Rebel Alliance was going to have a base on this grassland planet called Sisamon. Uh, obviously, that didn't come to be, but Ralph generated a lot of art for it. Uh, the design never made it onto screen. Uh, the Expanded Universe actually did use this as a starting point for what they thought Alderaan might look like in one of these coffee table books in the 90s. But mm -hmm. as episode three proved, uh, Alderaan doesn't look like that. And that freed up this art uh, for further exploration. Here's another Ralph painting. Uh, he painted these transmission towers for a, uh, a licensed Star Wars book in the 90s. And it just, it, it really captures this magic quality that, that he can he can create in terms of scale, in terms of lighting, in terms of tone. It's just this magical realism. Fast forward to now, this is a piece of concept art from Rebels, and you can see that we've taken that design directly and uh, are, are creating it for the show. This next painting by Dave Filoni actually combines all the pieces oh, wow. together. We've got the grasslands, 
We've got the communications tower. It's all put together in order to create this new planetary environment for the series. Another big piece of news uh, to come out of Celebration Europe was the unveiling of what is the principal starship in Star Wars Rebels. We call it the Ghost. And it is the main ship that our good guys travel around in. And it's a lot like the Millennium Falcon in that. It's a light freighter. It uh, may not look like much, but it's got a word count. It's got a few surprises, so on and so on. So uh, we'll get to see that in action. And uh, much like a lot of things in Star Wars, it draws inspiration from this tactile, real-world history that we always look at. So like the cockpit and the nose turret bubble is very much inspired by the look of a B-17 World War II bomber. <coughs> this was some of the art that was shown at Celebration here. We got to see the ghost on the offensive and uh, I guess on the defensive here, running away from Imperials. So that was more or less what was said at Celebration Europe. And uh, today, though, we're not going to talk about the ghost. We're not going to talk about... We're not even going to talk about the rebels that give the TV show its name. We're not talking about the heroes. Today we're talking about the opposition, the yes. bad guys. We're taking a look at the might of the <laughs> Now, So what does it mean when the Empire moves into your planet? I guess we need to set the galactic stage a little bit. And uh, in doing so, I'll, I get to debunk a rumor, which is always kind of fun. The series takes place about 14 years after the events of Episode 3 of Mentioned Sith, and that was when Chancellor Palpatine declared himself the leader of the First Galactic Empire, and as we all remember, that was met with thunderous applause. And that's something to keep in mind. For most of what is now the former Republic, the Empire was a welcome change from the chaos of the Clone Wars and the uncertainty of the Separatist crisis that preceded that for like 10 years beforehand. So. People wanted stability and security, no matter the cost. Especially for many of the inner system worlds, the worlds closer to Coruscant, the Empire inspired fervent patriotism compared to the disillusionment of the decline of a republic. So one of the principal objectives of an empire, well, any empire, but especially one ruled by a guy who screams out unlimited power, is, uh, is expansion. The Empire wants to grow, it wants more territory, and it does this by, um, by pushing out into uh, the unruly outer rim territories where the Republic never really had much of a stay. I mean, the Empire wants order, and that's where most of the disorder is in the galaxy, so it's going to fly a flag there, it's going to make a presence. And someone like Palpatine can actually sell that pretty easily. We're going to go annex independent worlds in the outer rim territory because the last big war that we just suffered through was caused by independent systems. So that's what we have, the Empire moving out onto the frontier and coming across planets like this one. This is the planet Lothal, and that's going to be one of the principal locations on the show. It's in the Outer Rim Territories. It's been settled for a long time, but it has always existed beyond the borders of galactic civilization, beyond the Republic. It's a frontier world. Now, when the Empire moves into the frontier and decides it wants a planet, and it wants that planet to be an Imperial planet. It doesn't do what we kind of automatically assume it does and it invades in full force. The Empire actually doesn't have the resources to invade every planet that it wants to control. So the ideal situation is if a planet has a civilization, you go in and you make sure that that planetary civilization, and both all has one, is loyal to the Empire. If that leader isn't loyal, you maybe put in a guy or a girl who is loyal. Um, and that's basically what happened to Lothal. The Empire moves in. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing at first. Here, here's another look at, at the planet. It's a frontier world. Lothal, like many worlds in the outer rim, is poor, or at least not good at exploiting the resources it does have. To kind of use a real world example, imagine Lothal as a sleepy town that's poor, that sits at the end of a rail spur that no one ever uses. And then here comes a big, rich empire saying, you know what? You're not a dead end anymore. You're going to be the starting point of a new rail line that's going to go into the frontier. A lot of people on the fall are excited about that idea. Um, it sounds promising, especially those capitalizing citizens who want to make money and seek security. So Lothal did welcome the Empire at first, and the Empire brought it with it. Industry, Lothal's a mineral-rich world, the Empire set up factories and mines. 
But as I said, the empire keeps expanding, and part of that expansion is quotas. They have, they need, they need supplies, they need TIE fighters, they need material. And those quotas start at first reasonable, then unreasonable, then difficult, then crushing. It becomes pretty apparent, especially those with open eyes, that the empire does not have Lothal's best interest in mind, and that honeymoon period doesn't last, and that allows for people with, uh, with rebellious thoughts to, uh, to emerge, I guess it's one way of saying it. In addition to minerals, and, and, and uh, in addition to minerals, one of Lothal's key, key resources is people. This is a poster that you might find on the streets of Lothal, and it's encouraging you to enlist. Um, it's encouraging citizens to help for the future of the empire. You may have seen another poster that went online recently of, of stormtroopers all standing, and a big line says, join. You know, the citizens of Lothal are urged to uh, join the TIE fighter or stormtrooper academies, or to work at the CNR fleet systems factory that's in the capital. So let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the Imperials that you're going to find in Lothal. Here we have, of course, the classic stormtroopers. Probably the most potent symbol of the empire. And for the 501st who are in attendance, uh, you can see that the design doesn't vary too much from the screen version. So I'd, if you want to try to tackle and create a version of this to wear, go for it. But you know, you don't have to. You can, you can pass on the screen accurate ones. Um, this is the animation model for, for the stormtroopers in the show. One of the things that came out with Rebels is now I guess we could finally confirm long-held speculation or, or debate, settle the debate as to what the difference is between a clone trooper and a stormtrooper. Because uh, this comes direct from George Lucas. Now, George isn't you know, working on this show, but he really developed the era. He, he developed a lot of notes as to what happens between episode three and four, and, and Rebels uh, gets the benefit from that stuff. And, and part of the things that he described was the fact that um, clone troopers, um, clone troopers basically stop production. Stormtroopers are men and women like you and me. They're, they're citizens that volunteer. And, um, it's, it's an interesting contrast because it's an interesting commentary from George on this because the lab-grown clone troopers actually exhibited too much individuality to be of use to the Empire. You could actually find better uniformity in fervent patriots who volunteer for service. Here's a concept maquette by artist Darren Marshall for the development of Rebels. Darren did this for all the major characters on the show, um, and he did that for Clone Wars beforehand. Um, the look of Rebels is distinct from Clone Wars. Yeah, distinct enough that we can't reuse any of the animation models from Clone Wars. Everything has to be created from scratch. Um, the, the look is a little bit more rounded, less angular than what was developed for Clone Wars designs. This is an almost finished CG model of a Stormtrooper. Um, this is one of the images actually that was shown in Celebration Europe. You can see that the Rebels models really feature you know, visible brush strokes and uh, detail like that, and, and that's taken from examination of Ralph McQuarrie's paintings. They really look at his brush strokes, so as much as possible, this show is a Ralph McQuarrie painting come to life. Another look at the Stormtrooper. And, you know, all this stuff was so evocative and so iconic that uh, Hasbro couldn't resist making it their line look for uh, their upcoming product lines for Star Wars Rebels. So, collectors, if you've been on the floor, you've probably seen this. Collectors, this is... Uh, this is, these are the colors and shapes to look for when you're, you're picking up Star Wars toys in 2014. Another Stormtrooper-related prop, the classic uh, blaster pistol. Uh, 501st members and prop builders will tell you that this is based on a British Sterling submachine gun. But those who are really detailed-oriented, I, I will point out that there is a difference with the Rebels version of the gun. There's this little flare, and I think you all see that on the top of the barrel that you're not going to find in a real-life version. Why is that in there? Because the original Kenner action figure had that little bump on it, and we just kind of wanted to pay homage to that, so... Yeah. <laughs> so there's a little trivia for you. Another of the Imperial forces you're going to see on the show, classic TIE fighter pilots. And uh, again, based on the episode 4 costume, just like stormtroopers, these are volunteer forces, they're not clone pilots. And here's a new model they're going to see. It's the ATDP pilot. Whoa. What's an ATDP? Well, I'll get to that. But that is cool. you'll see it's a combination of the uh, ATAT driver from The Empire Strikes Back and the ATSD driver from Return of the Jedi, and some concept art thrown in there. And what they drive around in, well, before I get to that, I, I want to talk about another one of the key influential artists in the development of Star Wars, and that's Joe Johnston. Yes. 
he is an amazing, amazing artist. A claim director in his own right. He directed Rocketeer, Captain America, uh, Hidalgo, which is my dad's favorite movie. Um, and uh, Joe, Joe, what I would say, Joe and Ralph are the two artists I would credit most with establishing the look of Star Wars. And what Joe did is he took Ralph's kind of elegant, magical, fantastic designs and ruggedized them and added some real engineering heart to them as well. So the two of them were, were great compliments to each other. Ralph, um, well, Joe specifically, Joe de designed um, the saucer-shaped Millennium Falcon for, for episode four, which was a relatively late addition of the movie, if you know your Star Wars history. Um, and as well, he designed the look of Boba Fett and uh, the speeder bikes from episode six, and the scout walkers from episode five. But to get to the design of the scout walkers, um, he started off with, with some various different sketches. Here's, here's an early one. Now, this one actually made it into a newspaper strip in the 80s, illustrated by Al Williamson. But uh, when we found it in the archives, uh, the folks on Rebels decided that's going to be a, a, on the show. So this is the ATDP Walker that's going to be in the series. And uh, that stands for All-Terrain Defense Pod. It's tasked with protecting the assets on the, almost all Imperial operations installations. Nice big heavy laser cannon out there on, on its chin. And inside, it's got stadium seating, so that's great. It's a uh, driver up front, gunner in the back. Uh, when the Empire needs to get somewhere swiftly, it deploys speeder bikes, of course, but these are the speeder bikes that we're going to see in the low Again, these are from uh, Joe Johnson design. The interesting thing about this, it's, it's actually a telescoping design. The uh, forks and the uh, steering vanes, you kind of telescope into the body so the whole thing kind of compresses uh, for, I don't know, ease of stowage, I guess. Now, when it comes to, well, when you need to transport a squad of troopers or, or bring a bunch of prisoners in over land, uh, what vehicle do you use for that? Sometimes, well, sometimes the old designs are the best, and, and we've got a video to, to highlight that one. So if we, we can play that. prisoner transports and the stormtrooper sockets on the side. Uh, I'm glad we managed to keep the adorable turret. It's like, it's got the cutest guns in the Empire. Look at that. <laughs> so, yes, we will see an Imperial Troop transport, and if there was ever any doubt that there are old school fans working on the show, just look at that kinder goodness being finally being brought to life. <laughs> Let me put this someplace safe. <laughs> Alright, so that's that's the ground forces, right? Yeah. So, when it comes to protecting the skies and the space over Lothal, obviously, we turn to TIE Fighters. And, um, as you saw in the introductory video, TIE Fighters, this piece of art greatly influenced the development of the TIE Fighter. And this, it's early art, Ralph art, so the proportions of the TIE Fighter are different. It's got the larger ball cockpit and the smaller wings. And which coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, is what uh, makes it look like the Kenner toy. So in this case, the TIE Fighter that's going to be in Star Wars Rebels, and here it is, um, without texture, it's just the geometry of the model, more closely resembles the toy, but that wasn't by intent, it's just we're basing it on the same piece of artwork that we believe the Kinder artist uh, based it off. Um, Alright, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, just because I, we're a room full of fans and I want to illustrate the kind of detail uh, and debate that enters into uh, discussing classic Star Wars stuff. So, let's see. How does one get into a TIE fighter? <laughs> From the top. Does anyone have any guess? Want to throw that? From the top. From the top, all right. Yeah. That's what, all right. This is the kind of debate we have. First of all, for the show, we have to create the interior of the TIE fighter, which means referencing a lot of the photography and the film footage that was shot in the set. 
to which we face our first conundrum, and this happens a lot in Star Wars, in that the interior of the ship does not actually fit uh, the exterior of the model. So there always has to be a creative push and pull. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people say, you enter in through the top, and that's what this cross-section art from an old 97, uh, 1997 cross-sections book that was published in the UK kind of positive. The, the hatch is the top, that's how you enter it. And that seems to be the consensus based on, well, it seems to be memories of the old Kenner Toy. But if you look at the original ILM blueprints, they're in the making of the TIE Fighter. This is Steve Golley's blueprints from ILM. I'm going to zoom in on that one. Look at that. The hatch is in the back. You go in from the back of it. And if you look at the set, they kind of they did some attempt to support that. There's a hexagonal window behind the TIE Fighter right there. And, uh, you know, that corresponds to this window in the back of the tie. And then, you know, if you look at the circle, it's got all these Greegrees and gears, and that part doesn't. So, so clearly, yeah, of course, it, you, you get in through the back. But the case against that is the fact that they use the same cockpit for Vader. Uh, and so Vader's got that thing back there. But if you look at Vader's ship, oh yeah, there it is here. You can see it's got blueprint stu uh, blue screen stuff so that you can see the trench behind it. But if you look at Vader's ship, there's no window back there. So... That throws in the counter argument. Well, that's not a portal. That's got to be some sort of view screen or something. I don't know. The thing is, Vader can't get out through there, so Vader must get through the top. And if Vader gets out through the top, why can't everyone get out through the top? <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of emails that we have. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And that's a long way of saying that we avoided the whole thing by chickening out and saying that this is an earlier version of a TIE fighter anyway. So we're putting the hatch on the top. And that doesn't make any statement whatsoever on what the episode four TIE Fighters do, since that five, that's five years down the line in the timeline anyway, so <laughs> dodge a bullet there. Wow. When uh, developing ships for Rebels, especially on the Imperial Forces, we realized we needed something in between the spectrum of the TIE Fighter and the super large uh, capital ships that the Empire wields. We did something mid-sized. And as a starting point, uh, Dave Filoni directed his artists to this freighter design from Episode 1. This actual image is from Episode 2. It's a freighter designed by Doug Chang. It's called the Gozanti Freighter inside the... Uh, it's, that's what its name is, anyway. And uh, it's one of the few ships from Episode 1 that really has an original trilogy aesthetic. It has... I'm going to use some model-making terms here. It's had scribed planes, which is like flat areas of, of the model with lines on it, which in the old days would have been done just by carving an exacto knife. And it has like a sandwich filling, as we call it, of greeblies, just these little details that are just packed in. So we used this ship, uh, kind of bulked it up, stripped its paint design, added a few bits to make this Imperial Freighter. Oh, that's cool. And uh, you'll see, that's you know, the wings kind of suggest it has a little design linear similarity to a Star Destroyer. It's got a TIE Fighter wrap, so it has definite functionality, and any Star Wars fan worth his salt will tell you that TIE Fighter is a short-range ship, doesn't have hyperdrives, so it needs a ship like this. Uh, here's its belly, and you can see the docking tubes underneath, which is yet another case for needing a TIE Fighter pilot to go in and out from the top of a ship, otherwise this design doesn't work. Nice. And uh, so that, yeah, so that's a new capital ship coming up in Rebels. Uh, but of course, when our rebel heroes get in real trouble, the Empire calls in the big guns, and uh, we call them this ship. Yeah. This, this art actually got a big round of applause when they showed it in celebration as well. And actually, this one's a little out of date. Uh, Dave, in, you know, we're, we're, we're five years, we're about five years before episode four, so we want to make as many connections as possible to the aesthetics and designs of episode four. Actually, as an aside, I'll, I'll even tell you that Joel Aaron, our CG and effects supervisor, is taking that task so seriously that he's actually examining the film stock that episode four was shot on to kind of create that look. Even though this show is not going to use film as a, as a CG animated show, he wants to see what can be done to capture that aesthetic. Anyway, uh, Dave's interest in making a Star Destroyer resemble the episode four version as much as possible means a little slight art change. If you look at the conning tower, it's got that larger X-shaped design on top of it because Darth Vader's Star Destroyer has that in Episode 4 and the regular Star Destroyers don't have that in Episode 5. Um, interesting thing about creating a CG ship on a show like Rebels is that, uh, you know, in the original trilogy when they made the Star Destroyer, the first Star Destroyer was about 3 feet long as a model, the second one was 6 feet long. The Millennium Falcon, the original one was 4 feet wide, the second one was 2 feet wide. 
things are built to their own scale and are scaled accordingly uh, when designing the shot. In CG, the Star Destroyer is actually built in real size relative to the model of the ghost. And uh, so that you could stage, you know, you could stage a scene by throwing in the ghost, throwing in TIE fighters, and throwing in the Star Destroyer, and they're all the same size, and then you set up the camera accordingly. So that's an example of that. This, these aren't necessarily scenes that are in Rebels, but it's taking the ghost model and showing the, the scale of the Star Destroyer. And that allows the artist to get in the amount of detail required to really sell, sell the scale of, uh, of those capital ship. Uh, this is the original model I was telling you about from episode 4. This is actually a, a painting um, without all the airbrushing effects done. This is, you've probably seen this painting on, uh, I mean, sorry, I've seen this photo on, uh, on you know, old puzzle boxes and storybooks, but this was the original version before they, they embellished it. And you can see that the episode 4 Star Destroyer has this little, these little extra details on the, it's one of the telltale signs that you're dealing with in episode 4 Star Destroyer, is these, these little extra fins on its engines. Um, in this case, we took some creative license and didn't seek to replicate that. Dave, Dave wasn't interested in doing that because Dave was so struck by this painting that was done for The Empire Strikes Back. Mm. Uh, it's a production painting by Ralph McQuarrie. This painting was actually used in the first trailer for Empire Strikes Back because they had no footage. So they actually just, the very first trailer for Empire was Ralph paintings. And um, if you notice, the engines are really nice and smooth. And that's basically what the Rebels ship is uh, going to emulate. It's got. It's got nice smooth curves on the engines, but it also has the top of the conning tower. And that's probably a sight that our rebel heroes are happy at. It's a Star Destroyer flying away from them, so that's good news there. So, that is an overview of the Imperial forces. Not all of them, but the bulk of the Imperial forces that we're going to see on the show. And I think what it illustrates, especially the design of the Star Destroyer itself, is um, how serious the threat of the Empire is. And Rebels is definitely a return to the episode four mentality of the heroes being underdogs. They're up against some incredible odds, uh, but they've got hope on their side. It's, it's a departure from where we were at Clone Wars for the longest time, because in Clone Wars, the heroes were the establishment. If Anakin Skywalker crashed his Jedi Starfighter, he could get a new one right away, essentially. With our heroes, if they lose an asset, if they lose something valuable, they have to get it back, they have to repair it if it's broken, get a new one or whatever, you know, they're always scrounging. And, um, but you know, just like all good heroes, they, they've got hope on their side and, and they've got conviction and uh, we're going to follow their adventures. Now, we're not going to go into who the rebel characters are yet, that's going to be for another convention panel someday. But uh, we do still have some more to talk about. <laughs> You inadvertently saw a little bit of this earlier, but, but Dave wanted to, to give a finale to this presentation. We've covered a lot of ground. We want Dave to kind of recap some of where we've gone, uh, give some insight into who's working on the show, and uh, give a little tease of, of something new that the show is bringing forward. So if we could run that video now, please. A lot of exciting things happening behind the scenes here at Star Wars Rebels. Our Rebel Alliance is made up of Greg Weissman and Simon Kinberg. This is the strength that Lucasfilm is building to ensure the future of the Star Wars franchise. Well, one of the things I'm really excited about with Rebels is that I have a lot of the Clone Wars crew coming on uh, to make this show. And they're a very experienced crew. The design department still all Clone Wars veterans. I've got Killian Plunkett back as art director. I've got Joel Aaron, my VFX supervisor wizard, Keith Kellogg, supervising animation. Stuart Lee, my longest running episode director for the Clone Wars, is back with me. And I actually brought on his brother, Steve Lee, a veteran of LucasArts. We're taking it to the next level now. And one thing that all of us were excited about was the Empire. We've done the Republic, we've done a lot of things that the foreshadowed the coming empire, but we had never really gone in and drawn the TIE fighters, the stormtroopers, or Imperials. And, and that's something that we're having a great time doing on this series. I mean, when we were at Celebration Europe, the Star Destroyer version of the Rebels came up, and it got the biggest cheer out of everything we showed. It just really showed me how much fans love the empire. They're great bad guys. They've got the look, they've got great designs, their uniforms are famous for saying things like, you rebel scum, you rebel scum. But it's great to have those characters back in play. It reminds us all the time that we do as kids when the Empire were the bad guys. They were the ones to watch out for, and uh, <laughs> they're on their way back in the big Every era 
of a Star Wars saga seems to have its own marquee villain, a character that really captures the idea of the enemy and, and what evil is. Now, for most people I know that once Darth Vader hits the scene, he is the preeminent and the only one. But in this time period between episodes three and four, there is the possibility that there are villainous characters that you have up till now been unaware of. So here for you exclusively, I would like you to take your first look at the evil which is the Empire's Inquisitor tasked by Darth Vader to hunt down the remaining Jedi Knights. I'm just going to keep us in darkness for a little bit to appreciate this image a little bit longer because this was produced exclusively for New York Comic Con. That is the animation model of the Inquisitor posed with the animation models of the Stormtroopers. Uh, this image for you to enjoy. All right, we're going to bring the house lights up now and I am happy to attempt to answer any question you have. Uh, although I suspect you are going to try to ask me stuff that I can't talk about. Um, yeah, we got microphones set up, so... I think we have two, right? Alright, is that... You ready to go? That is. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, are we going to stick with uh, the ghost and its crew, or is it going to be like the Clone Wars, where we switch heroes from week to week? It is the design, uh, if I understand your question, uh, the, the design of the show is for the episodes to roll up chronologically. It's, we aren't, we aren't going to be jumping around. But I mean, are we going to follow uh, the same theme of heroes? Oh, the same crew? Yeah, it's primarily the same, the same heroes, and we're focusing on that. Now, there's different aspects in that, but we're not, uh, we're not hopping around to different bunches of characters. Okay, thank you. Oh, you know, I've got something to say, too. Uh, we have some giveaways. Hopefully people will intercept you to give you these giveaways. Um, we have these awesome Imperial CNR fleet system guys. Nice. So we have a bunch for you to the show, uh, for you who came here. So uh, hopefully someone will find you and get you this stuff. All right, uh, do we have a question on this side here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, one thing, and hopefully I'm something you can answer. Um, with the, uh, the Inquisitor, is it going to be like the... Um, you know, is it going to be more like uh, lightsaber type fights? Because yeah. are there any Jedi still around that are that type of that's, that's, a, that's a good question. The Inquisitors are brought in to hunt down Jedi. So you can reason from the fact that from what we, the fact that there is one in the series means that the Empire has reason to believe that a Jedi is involved somewhere. And so that's, that's what brings it in. And yes, we saw from the glimpse of there, he does have a lightsaber. There, there's a big question as to what is the Jedi role in the show. And, um, you know, the teaser that came out said something about Jedi that is kind of intriguing. For those of you who are wondering, the Jedi will have, there is a presence for the Jedi in the show, but we are being very cognizant of the fact that Order 66 signifies something important, and we do not want to diminish the importance of Luke Skywalker being the last of the Jedi. So, know that we have that in mind, uh, as we go forward, and that's all I can say about that. We're gonna go back to this side here. Um, I know that you said the Inquisitor's job is really to uh, take down the remaining Jedi. I was wondering, does he in any way have a correspondence with Starkiller when he comes in with the Force Unleashed? Because I know that, that Vader had him specifically do that job as well. Um, does that character have any, does he fail along the way? Or does he have any correspondence that they kind of meet or something? Exactly who the Inquisitor works and connects to, I can't get into just now. So, so is he not exactly empirical, or is he? He's an Imperial. Okay. He, he, is, he, is, he functions for the Empire. For those of you who are wondering, the Inquisitor actually was a bit of a pre-existing lore that actually dates back to the 90s. Actually, you go all the way back to 87 to find an example of uh, the idea of there being these agents, the, the Empire's sinister agents, I believe it, it says. Um, that we're out there making sure that any vestige of the Jedi will act out. So, I know that doesn't really answer your question, but that's what I can say, right? Thank you. Thanks. This side? Hi. Uh, I know you said that the Empire is mostly made of enlisted men now, with the stormtroopers and the pilots. 
but is there still a chance that there might be some clones hanging around that will it's, it's really interesting. Again, this, this stuff comes from some of George's notes, and, uh, you know, the clone troopers still, like, the, even though the cloning operations, as we know them from the Clone Wars stop, those clone, war, those clone troopers are still around, and they're aging twice as fast as everyone else. And it's kind of like this weird thing. It's like some of them still believe in the system, still believe in what they know, and uh, have gone on to become trainers of stormtroopers, while others have kind of been discarded by a society that's never really appreciated what they were to begin with. George provided all these notes about what happened after the Clone Wars. It was absolutely fascinating, and, and we're, we're developing Rebels with it in mind. It's not necessarily what the show is going to be about, but we always are cognizant of what his idea was as far as what happens after episode three. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay. My question uh, is, um, can we expect to see any characters from Star Wars The Clone Wars show up in Rebels? Star Wars The Clone Wars? Uh, that is a good question <laughs> that I can't really answer. Uh, I will say that, you know, given the people that are involved in the show, and given how many Clone Wars veterans that are on the show, there, there's a lot of interest in, in, uh, uh, in something like that. But what exactly has ended up on the show, I can't, I can't get into. Okay, I just wanted to... Thank you, thank you for your questions. On this side. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is that... Well, I had two questions, but uh, yeah, you answer like what the... Stormtroopers and everything, but the second one is Will the TV series be based mo mostly about the bad guys instead of the good guys? The bad guys definitely have a huge presence, but the focus is on uh, On the rebels that give the show the title. It, it is on a specific group of, of Heroes that are rebelling against what's happening on Lothal and nearby space. Um, it, it's, you know, we're not ready to talk about the heroes yet, but I know that there's a big appreciation and fandom of the villains, so that's why I decided to come to New York Comic Con and talk about them first. Kind of set the stage, let you understand who they're fighting up against, uh, so that when we introduce them, you have better appreciation of what they're up against. So, uh, thank you. Thanks. What's that? Howdy. I had a quick question about uh, the hero ship you mentioned a couple of times, the Ghost. Is that its final and full name, or will it have a more descriptive name? Like, for example, uh, the Millennium Falcon is a lot of times referred to as just the Falcon, but the full name is a little more descriptive than that, a little less generic than just the Ghost. Right. Uh, is there any chance that this ship will have something a little, a full name that's a little less generic than the Ghost? The pilot of the Ghost has called it the Ghost for a uh, very good reason. And um, there's more to it. There's more to the ghost than we've seen, but as far as its name goes, it is what it is. Okay. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? What's hey. going on? Um, uh, first off, thanks for coming to Comic Con. Love everything that I saw. Oh, totally you. awesome. Um, my favorite, when I think of Star Wars, the first thing I think of is always John Williams amazing music. So have you guys had any conversations of composers and where you guys are going to take uh, the show's music to? Dave has some things in mind. Um, we've not settled on, or we're not ready to announce who, who's involved in the music, but we all, well, let me put it this way. When Dave draws Rebels, he listens to some very specific John Williams tracks. And I'm sure that is informing his thought process on what he wants the show to, to sound like. So. Well, I thought he was this man on the table. Well, thank you. Yeah, but again, thanks for coming. No problem. Up. He listens to John Williams' music if he's not listening to a Penguins game. Um, so. <laughs> hey, Pablo, I'm a big fan. Um, just wanted to ask, um, is there any difference between uh, Clone Wars being made for Cartoon Network and this show appearing on Disney? Is there any influence that has on the creation in any way in terms of subject matter? I'd say the difference comes from it being a different show, but not necessarily as to where it airs. You know? The biggest difference for us right now is, is, is scheduled time. This show is, is being done at a much quicker pace than, than Clone Wars done, was done, but 
Not because well, a lot of it, we've, we've learned so much from the development of Clone Wars is that if you look at what was done in season five, say compared to season one, we're able to roll that knowledge and work a lot more effectively and efficiently now with Rebels. But with Clone Wars, Clone Wars was a very odd situation in that we were even a year out in terms of production um, compared to where we were broadcasting. You know, we'd have like almost a year's worth of content like ready to go. Still had to do final mixes and stuff, but for fundamentally, the animation was done. Here, we don't have that kind of, uh, you know, that, that lead time. And it's, it, so we're having to get used to that kind of pace. But um, in terms of subject matter, no, I mean, the big difference is just not having George. Uh, and, and we are now trusted to, you know, the, the executive producers are now trusted to kind of fill in that gap and, and tell the kind of stories that he inspires, but they're not coming directly from him. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey. I was just wondering, since the Gargoyles creator is going to be involved in, uh, I mean, the, the show, will there be any Star Trek voices like Marina Sirtis or Jonathan Frakes involved? There's, there's no casting yet to be announced, but everyone to the table is bringing in sort of favorites and suggestions. So uh, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me if Greg Champion or something like that, but I don't want to speak for him. Um, we'll have to see how that that that's out. Uh, has anybody talked about it behind closed doors? Well, if it, if it was behind closed doors, I, I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, but we did get George the kind of Clone Wars. That, that always surprised me. Yes, I'm Hello. Um, keeping it with the theme of villains for the panel, um, will we be seeing some brand new bounty hunters in the show? We'll say that the, the underworld influence is part of the series, so there are characters of that type to, to show up. Yes, new ones. Yeah, so. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's not just black and white rebels versus imperials. It, it takes into account, you know, it, it logically extrapolates what you would find on a world like Lothal and its neighboring territories and uh, basically runs with it. So, on this side. That other guy actually asked, asked my question. I was going to ask you if James Earl Jones was going to be Darth Vader. But uh, now my question is, are there any other classic Star Wars toys that you're going to be bringing into the show? I, I'm trying to think if we've exhausted our... I mean, I, I, we were all excited about the uh, Imperial Troop, Troop Transport. And, uh, I, and as I pointed out, the TIE Fighter really draws in some of that DNA. Nothing's coming to mind, but as we said, we're still in production, so there is always the opportunity to throw in stuff. Um, I know there's many rig fans on the art department team, and uh, I'll bug them when I get back to work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. As for creating uh, new alien species, are you going to stick with everything that's uh, already in canon or in continuity, or are you going to come up with some new things? There's an uh, opportunity for both pre uh, species that we know of and, and brand new species as well. But what's interesting is, is uh, even when we go with a new species, a new culture, there's a strong possibility that you'll recognize it because Dave's starting point is always to crack open a Ralph McCory art book and look at any of his designs that haven't been used before. So there were some conceptual aliens that are the starting points for, for new characters on the show. Oh, hi. Um, I know that the Sith Inquisitor, that, no, not the Sith Inquisitor, the Imperial Inquisitor is going to have a huge role within the series since he's appointed by Darth Vader himself to hunt down for the last of the Jedi, uh, since the great Jedi Purge. But knowing that he has such strong ties to Darth Vader, and knowing that Darth Vader has an elite squad known as Vader's Fist that had a huge role in that Purge, well, is there any chance that, um, that those stormtroopers that were behind this is, uh, no, the Imperial Inquisitor from that promotional image had anything to do with the Bible first or anything like that? Well, I, I can say, first off, that no, those, those weren't stormtroopers of the Bible first with the Inquisitor. But what you do bring up is, is a good point. I mean, you know, without getting into too much detail, we know that Vader is around. We know who the Imperial characters are around in this era. Um, but at the same time, the story has to develop and... Um, you know, we're starting off in a very local area of space, and one of the things that our, our heroes will run into is the more successful they are, the harder, the bigger bosses they have to fight, so to speak. Um, 
and I'll just leave it at that before I say too much. Yeah, my last question is, is there any chance that um, you have any idea when we will see the unreleased episodes of Star Wars Clone Wars at all? Yes, Dave did me a huge favor by giving this answer on Facebook and Twitter the other night. So, or at least giving an answer. So, as everyone knows, there, there are some produced and finished Clone Wars episodes that did not air. In fact, they, they just finished wrapping up the last of these episodes. And Dave announced online yesterday that you will be seeing this content in early 2014. Yeah. And I've just been told we have one last question, so I'm going to do it. Um, I know that Clone Wars had a lot of characters that died in it, and stuff like that, and I wanted to ask two very specific things. One, will characters die in Star Wars Rebels, and two, is Ahsoka still alive? Alright. I'll answer your first one, because I said one last question. <laughs> if you had flipped the order of this, I would have given away everything right now, but no, you went with that one first. <laughs> Uh, will people die? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a war. The, the stakes are high. I'll, I'll say our touch point for the tone of the show is episode four. And episode four has a lot of, of tonal shift. There's, there's great camaraderie, there's great banter, there's moments of absolute great fun. But the villains are villains, and we see them do villainous things. And we're cognizant of that as, as we do Rebels, so. So thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Can I get, wait, can I get just one quick question? Just one? Wait, over here. Is there any possibility that this is going to tie into episode four? Are we going to eventually see any origin episodes of like Han Solo and Chewbacca? Well, I, I can't get into specifics that, but episode four is only five years away in the timeline, and we know that, and we're going to make the most of that, so. And any good artwork would be the original Stormtrooper concept. If you ever do a uh, snow planet, it looks really cool. Well, thank you all for coming.